Hello, and welcome to Cal State University Fullerton School of Education Department of Secondary Education Anti-Racism Webinar Series. This is our first installment of seven webinars in this first series, The History of Activism in Education and the Teacher's Ethical Role in Developing and Protecting Children. I was here with Dr. Etta Hollins who helped facilitate the webinar series with me. Dr. Etta Hollins is the Ewan Marion Kaufman Endowed Chair for Urban Teacher Education at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. She has spent the past 22 years leading faculty across the nation in designing and redesigning excellence and pre-service teacher preparation programs. Her books Culture and School Learning, Rethinking Field Experiences in Pre-Service Teacher Preparation, and Teaching to Transform Urban Schools, Powerful Pedagogy and Practice, have been re referenced here for the webinar as well as the framing for the Anti-Racist Education webinar series. She, present she presently serves as a member of the Accreditation Council for the Council for Accreditation of Education Preparation, or CAPE, the Research and Policy Advisory Council for the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering, and the Teacher Education Advisory Council for the Salash Kutenai College. She has received numerous awards in recognition for her work, including Lifetime Achievement Awards for the American Educational Research Association and Pittsburgh State University at Kansas. In 2015, she received the American Education Research Association Presidential Citation for her work in advancing knowledge of teaching and learning for urban and undeserved students. She received the AERA Division K 2016 Legacy Award. In 2018, Professor Hollins received the honor of induction as an AERA Fellow for her contributions and national leadership in pre-service teacher preparation. I am Dr. Antoinette Linton, and I'm the lead faculty for the Anti-Racism webinar series, and currently and I'm an associate professor of science education here at CSU Fullerton. Since 2011, my work has focused on making science education more accessible to underserved children by focusing on epistemic practices, disciplinary literacy, and creating healthy classrooms for Latinx and African American children. I am currently the lead faculty for the Anti-Racist Education Webinar here and the Subject Area Coordinator for Science. So I'd like to welcome you all. The webinar series started on August 11th and it runs every two weeks until October 20th. Here are the topics that will be covered by the series. The next series is Anti-Racist Distance Learning uh, forming Communities and Technology on the 6th of October. And then our last anti-racist educational leadership with Dr. Valida Jones, Dr. Daniel Cho, Dr. Ernest Black, Eugene Fujimoto, and Dr. Nancy Watkins on October 20th. The purpose of this workshop was to create a historical context for anti-racist teacher practice and removing barriers to learning for all students. We come together to share and understand the concepts of anti-racist teaching practice and the ethical issues that have a racist, that racist practices produce. Then we examine different cases of violations of children's educational process and how teachers willfully play a role in this violation. Teachers can be active, reactive, compliant, or complicit in their roles as oppressors of children. Next, we examine cases representing teachers as cultural preservers and protectors of children. Afterwards, we engage in dialogue about the teacher's role in today's challenges when it comes to the protection and education of children, and then translating some of our ideas to concrete action for the school year. We will be using some terms during our discussion today, and I want to add some clarity to them as we work through the cases later in the webinar. As teachers, we have to have a common language to work effectively in combating racism in schools. 
we have three ideas that we are working with here. Anti-racist teaching practice, pedagogy, and curriculum. Here, anti-racist teaching practice is a combination of the definition of anti-racism by Dr. Ibram Kendi and the definition of teaching practice from Dr. Hollins. Therefore, an anti-racist teaching practice is the planning, enactment, interpretation, and translation of student performance that reliably produces epistemic intellectual and creative agency and this empowers students to pursue the professional endeavors of their choosing. This definition places the focus on teacher practice and providing agency for students. Pedagogy is then a system of practices that includes socially, culturally, historically grounded reflection that influences the planning, the enactment of learning episodes, the interpretation and translation of student performances performance outcomes. These practices are used to intentionally empower children to define themselves as capable and epistemologically literate human beings. And curriculum is the organization of the discipline that leads to equity between racialized ethnic groups and substantiated by anti-racist ideas about what knowledge is, who the knower is, the, epistemo the epistemology, and what the learner contributes. This is the framework that we use to guide this discussion. In order to provide anti-racist outcomes for our students and to lead the way to an equitable society, we need to tie back to some principles that are measurable, obtainable, and grounded in practice. Teachers engage in ethical practices that result in the preservation of the linguistic, cultural, and social attributes of children. Children leave the school environment feeling more like themselves than they came in. With this motivation, teachers are then agents in providing access to learning, which is the second tenet, without deconstructing or alienating the students. This is done through the purposeful choosing of curriculum and planning experiences that affirm a child's identity. That leads us to the third tenet, which is the purpose of schooling as affirming children's humanity and dignity. Schools can often be a place of humiliation distancing them from their language, culture, and socialization by assimilation. As teachers, we can change this to empower students to be more like themselves after we've taught them. Finally, teachers will ensure that students acquire disciplinary literacy, have positive and epistemologically useful curriculum pieces so that students acquire epistemic agency. Epistemic agency here means providing students opportunities to make decisions about the criteria for what counts as skills and knowledge when solving disciplinary problems. Dr. Hollins describes in her chapter on learning teaching through rotations in her edited volume, Rethinking Field Experiences, what this looks like in the classroom. She states that students engage in the discourse, documentation, and notation of the discipline. They practice as professionals do just in developmentally appropriate ways. The intention of this is to facilitate students' ability to use their analytical, intellectual powers through continuous exposures to opportunities for problem solving. Framing was described by Dr. Ella Hollins and centered on four forms of teacher action, participation, compliance, action, and response. Dr. Hollins gave an in-depth example of her four-part framework of the historical participation of teachers in civil and social justice movements and how we can frame the work we do now as teachers and protectors of children. This framework includes participation, compliance, reactions or responses, and taking action. Participation describes how teachers and organizations actively engage in the civil rights movement and current movements that are happening now, such as Black Lives Matter. Dr. Hollins provides an example of this when she describes how the National Education Association, the American Teachers Association, and the American Federation of Teachers have actively participated in supporting the education of ethnic minority children. Members of these organizations were actively involved in the civil rights movement. 
the participation being a form of activism, making desegregation of schools a number one priority. An example of this can be found in the NEA ATA collaborations around school accreditation. The NEA and the ATA collaborated together to desegregate and accredit Southern schools so that students would have an opportunity to go to college. Not all universities in the United States were segregated. Universities like uh, Ohio State were integrated at the time. Students who applied to attend these schools were required to show proof that they graduated from an accredited high school. Before the Civil Rights Movement, a tactic to disenfranchise African American students was not to grant accreditation to schools they attended. These were segregated schools. NEA and the ATA put a stop to that. Currently, the NEA has been very involved with DACA and has been against locking up children at the U.S. border. Next, the dis we, she discussed compliance. Teachers can engage in practices, policies, use of curriculum, or engage in school pro processes that are not in the best interest of children. They may comply in fear of being reprimanded or fear of losing their job. However, Silence gives the impression that teachers approve of the practices, policies, curriculum processes that may cause harm to children and interrupt the learning process. School officials and policymakers may not know that these factors are detrimental to the success of the students. What teachers can do is comply with objection. Comply with objection means that teachers can inform administrators, textbook adopters, parents, and other stakeholders that the materials or practices that are detrimental to learning and detrimental to the humanity and dignity of the children. Teachers can recommend vetted practices that are reliable and sustainable for student learning. An example of this in the past included teachers and professors who objected to the lack of representation of Mexican American and African American social science and humanities across the United States. Their object their objection and support of students increase Mexican American, Chicano studies, and African American history in college departments. Current examples of objections include shedding light on the lack of ethnic studies in public schools and not included the 1619 project in social science. Reactions and responses means when disenfranchisement of any group of students occurs or when the education process excludes ethnic minority children. LBGTQ plus students, socioeconomically disadvantaged, or languages other than English, teachers have a moral and ethical obligation to call attention to it and offer solutions. This is coupled with the action, which is being able to use one's own professional and social capital to act against social injustice out of a belief that it is in the best interest of the students and their education. For example, during the Civil Rights Movement, teachers would open their homes to marchers and prepare food. Some of the teachers would pick up the individuals from airports and bus depots and have them stay in their homes. All of these are examples of actions that teachers can take in order to create a more democratic and inclusive educational experience. We use the frame of teachers' historical participation of action to contextualize what we can do now during times of social unrest. We ask ourselves, how do we socially and historically contextualize this work in order to integrate the values we want our students to acquire as citizens of a global community? There are a number of ways we could use this frame to make decisions about how to participate as teachers in our schools and communities. It helps us frame the curriculum and pose questions about the benefits it has for our students. Does our curriculum perpetuate white supremacy and racism? Or does it include the complexities and richness of our country? Are we compliant in racist school policies and practices? Or are we strategically objecting to policies and practices that we know disenfran disenfranchise students? We then are able to discuss with others how to ethically care for children and provide access to learning that prepares them for college and beyond. We articulate the purpose of schooling as affirming children's humanity and dignity while ensuring disciplinary literacy, using and revising curriculum so that it is affirmative to students and to support students acquiring epistemic agency. Once again, epistemic agency in this dialogue is giving students opportunities to figure out how to pose and answer questions about the world and thus supporting students' agency 
over what counts as knowledge in the disciplines, for example. Teaching children how to write and read while also teaching them what editors do and providing developmentally appropriate ways of engaging in the skills of an editor is epistemic agency. For the webinar, Dr. Hollins provided four cases to review with the intention of grappling with some of these ideas that were explained in the framing. The four cases are the Freedom School Program, Systematic Racism in School Discipline, Systematic Racism in School Curriculum and Pedagogy, and the NEA's Action for Social Justice. For each of these cases, teachers and participants were to answer the following questions. What social justice anti-racist action do teachers engage in? What is the focus of the teacher practice in each case? What work still needs to be done? What areas of teaching and learning still need to be worked out in light of anti-racist teacher practice. The first case was the Freedom School Program. The historical challenge was to improve the conditions of schooling for black children in the South. The schools were not accredited, so there was limited opportunity for children to move on to college. Seeing this as a challenge, 250 black and white summer volunteers would go to the South to teach the children. In 1965, the Civil Rights Act was passed, banning unfair treatment of citizens. However, over, the, over time, we have seen the underperformance of black students as a group, the overrepresentation in special education, and the disproportionate use of harsh discipline against black students indicates that there's more work to be done. Harsh discipline includes suspension, expulsion, referral to law enforcement, and school-related arrests. Many issues involving harsh discipline results from relationships between teachers and students and among students. Creating a comfortable and supportive classroom environment that promotes the academic, social, emotional development of all students is an important aspect of teaching. Academic underperformance is most often related to curriculum framing and pedagogical practices that are inadequate for meaningful and productive learning. Individuals who grapple with this case must shift the perspective of blaming the children for their low academic performance to questioning the reliability and sustainability of teacher practices. What anti-racist strategies can we take from the history presented in this case to inform how we are going to deal with the current issues surrounding black and brown students? The second case is one concerning systematic racism in school discipline. The challenge was that parents were not fully informed about required procedures, their rights, and the responsibilities when consequences are invoked. Data from the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights indicates that black students are 16% of the school enrollment. However, they are 33% out of all school suspensions, 34% of expulsions, 27% of referrals to law enforcement, and 31% of school-related arrests. Many of the issues leading to harsh discipline are initiated in classrooms. This is an indication of a very serious issue. Here's the intervention. In 2014, the U.S. Department of Education, in collaboration with the Office of Civil Rights, issued an advice and guidance letter to assist the nation's public elementary and secondary schools in meeting their obligation under the federal law to administer student discipline without discriminating on the basis of race, color, or national origin. The following is a quote from this letter. The department strongly supports schools in their efforts to create and maintain safe and orderly educational environments that allow our nation's students to learn and thrive. Many schools have adopted comprehensive, appropriate, and effective programs demonstrated to reduce disruption and misconduct, support and reinforce positive behavior and character development, and help students succeed. Successful programs may incorporate a wide range of strategies to reduce misbehavior and maintain a safe learning environment, including conflict management, restorative practices, counseling, and structured systems of positive interventions. The department recognizes that schools may use disciplinary measures as part of the program to promote safe and orderly classrooms. However, 
the intention of this intervention hasn't met its expectations. What can teachers do in order to implement the advice that was given? Why do you think we haven't fully accomplished this? The third case concerns systematic racism in the school curriculum and pedagogy. The challenge was that the curriculum includes material that portrays Eurocentric domination and marginalizes the history, culture, and accomplishments of people of color in the United States. To combat this, the culturally relevant, culturally responsive pedagogy, multicultural education has been implemented. For example, synthetic and systematic phonics, the ultimate of Eurocentric approaches to early literacy, are now identified as the science of reading. Some researchers advocating for the science of reading claim that the process for learning to read is universal across learners, cultures, and languages, including the hard of hearing, languages codified as alphabetic, local graphic like Arabic or Chinese, and syllabic. Children who fail in learning to read using synthetic or systematic phonics are considered learning disabled by many proponents of the science of reading. These biased exclusionary practices are inconsistent with research evidence and theories of learning, indicating that teaching and learning are culturally derived products of socialization. What do teachers need to do in order to combat these types of practices? Methods that are geared towards European children being used on everyone in a universal way doesn't work. What anti-racist teaching practices and policies should we engage in to reverse this effect? The last case study is the story of the National Education Association's participation in the Civil Rights Movement. In 1904, John Robert Edward Lee founded the National Association of Colored Teachers, later identified as the American Teachers Association or the ATA. The ATA advocated for improving the quality of education for black students. An important effort of the ATA was the accreditation of segregated high schools for black kids. The Southern Association for the Accreditation of Colleges and Schools refused to accredit legally segregated black high schools. This limited black students' access to college education. In 1929, NEA collaborated with ATA to achieve accreditation for segregated black high schools. The ATA was among the organizations that made the largest financial contribution to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund supporting the Brown versus Topeka Board of Education in 1954. The celebrated decision in the Supreme Court case resulted in thousands of black teachers losing their teaching positions. The NEA supported the ATA in the advocacy for school desegregation and afterwards supported black teachers in their struggle for equal employment opportunities. In 1966, the ATE and the NEA merged. In 1968, NEA elected its first black president, Elizabeth Duncan Coons. Here's the follow-up. The NEA continues to support social justice through its annual social justice awards, its Center for Social Justice, the Diversity Toolkit, and the Social Justice Lesson Plans for Teachers. The following is a recent statement from the NEA website. The impacts of the pandemic and the violence against indigenous black and brown and LBGTQ communities has us all thinking a lot about what it means to be a community. How much harder we need to work to end systematic injustices and the value of our public spaces and services to ensure our health, safety, and the ability to thrive. These unusual times provide an opportunity to explore innovative strategies to spark change while also taking time to experience healing and joy. We provided a padlet to collect ideas from the participants of the webinar. We were very interested in the interpretations and translations of these cases into real teacher practice. We placed teachers in small groups and assigned different cases to each room. Each person was to read the case, go over the facilitative questions, and discuss the impact on teacher practice. 
The questions again were, what social justice anti-racist action do teachers engage in in the case? What is the focus of teacher practice in each case? What work still needs to be done? What areas of teaching and learning still need to be worked out in light of anti-racist teacher practice? It is important that participants get a chance to share out and to make sure the facilitator creates a place to make the responses public. This is the role of Padlet. So how do we empower ourselves as teachers, as professionals, having a historical precedent of activism and education? To implement principles of anti-racist schooling, part of it is to see this work as a practice. As a classroom teacher, there are some intentional practices and ideas that need to be operationalized as processes and procedures in the classroom. These ideas are a part of a healthy classroom series that I teach others that includes teachers knowing themselves enough to share who they are culturally, socially, and professionally with the children. This enables them to know the students and earn their trust. And it is important to hold your judgments, microaggressions, and, and grudges. We as teachers need to model behavior of a kind and very literate person to reinforce the community building processes in the classroom and build kinship bonds by teachers being elders in the room and we creating spaces where students feel emotionally and physically safe. These things are intentionally taught at the beginning of the school year and by November students will be able to self-cue when they want to engage in healthy ways. By April, the students will be able to teach each other how to engage in the classroom community when they enter it. How do we build into our classrooms and curriculum the values and literacies that empower students? Thank you for tuning in to the Secondary Education Department's workshop on the history of anti-racism in education. Please feel free to fill out the post survey shown as a QR scan here. Take care.